All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first webinar of the year. Um, this one is titled Electrical Safety Testing 101. Uh, last year, we did kind of a complete overview, part one and part two. Um, this presentation is very similar to that one. Um, I, I, I spiffed up a couple things of the presentation and we added a video. But for the most part, it covers a lot of that same information. So if you found last year's useful, uh, hopefully you'll find this year's useful as well. And to anybody who's new to the group, um, hopefully you find uh, this information useful and applicable to what you are doing. I think this will be especially helpful for people who, um, whether you have done electrical safety testing or not, if you're a test operator or you work with this type of equipment, this is designed to help you make sure that you have what you need to make your station safe and, and what to do um, when you're setting up a safety testing workstation. Uh, so that being said, uh, let's get on with the presentation. Uh, bear with me here today, guys. I'm, I'm fighting off a little bit of a bug, so I don't have my uh, usual energy level, but I won't let that uh, stop me from um, giving a good presentation here. Before we begin, a couple notes on the webinar. There's a couple different utilities that you have at your disposal, and you'll notice them on the right-hand side or wherever you put the bar for the GoToMeeting on your screen. There's a Q&A utility, and there's a chat utility. If you're having problems with the webinar itself, meaning the audio is cutting out or something's wrong with the video, looks like it's lagging, address those to Jim Kennessy, who's our host, via the chat line, and he'll be able to help you out with that. If you have questions about the material itself, please use our Q&A utility. We have a couple panelists helping us out today. Um, that's Syed Abidi, who's our applications engineer. And we also have a newer applications engineer, Bashan. This is actually his, his first webinar and they will be able to help you with any of the material. Um, this is, we do have a time limit here. We like to keep these to a little under an hour. Um, so we will leave it open at the end for some questions. Any questions that we cannot get to during the webinar, I will try to address during that time period. But um, as with every webinar, sometimes there are questions that are a bit too in-depth to get into um, for just time's sake. So if you do have questions that we are unable to address, you can always feel free to email us or call us, and we can discuss in person at, in length. We will give you that contact info at the end of the webinar. If you want a copy of this particular PowerPoint presentation, just email Jim. Um, either let him know on the chat line or email at jimk at asresearch.com, and he will be able to give you a copy of that. So that being said, um, since we do have a limited time here, let's dive into the material. So today's webinar outline um, for part one, and, and again, this is going to be a part one and part two type of webinar, we're really mostly going to talk about the safety aspects of the electrical safety testing field. Um, it's, it's something that's really important, and that's the reason why we have it as the very first webinar of the year, because we feel it's the most important part of the safety testing. Once that's out of the way, and then you get into the testing realm, you have your bases covered. So we're going to go over some brief information on safety itself, on uh, potential shock hazards, and, and what to look out for. Then we're going to get into the testing aspects. Uh, why do we test? Why are we running these high pot tests, these ground continuity tests, uh, leakage tests, things of this nature? Uh, and then we're going to get into methods for safety testing. Um, what I mean by that is setting up actual stations so that they're safe for an operator, test methods that you can employ to ensure that you have a test environment that's safe, and additional things you can add to your workstation to make sure that you have a safe testing workstation. And then at the very end of the webinar, I'm going to give you guys some training resources. Um, fortunately, a lot of these training resources, you can just go online and find them. They're great resources, um, and there's a standard called EN50191. You do have to pay for the standard. It's not that expensive. I believe it's about $150. Uh, but it's a great European norm standard that talks about setting up safe workstations. You don't technically have to be compliant to it in the U.S., but I think it's a, it's a great guideline for setting up a safe workstation. And it's only about 20 pages long. It's not like some of those monster standards that are 700 pages that are a bear to get through. This one's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy read, and it gives you some great guidelines. So after completing this webinar, you're going to be able to recognize an electrical safety hazard set up a safe testing workstation, and find resources for operator training. So before we get too involved with this discussion, let's talk about safety. 
What is it? Technically, the definition is the condition of being safe from undergoing or causing hurt, injury, or loss. This plays very well um, and, and is directly correlated to safety devices, a device or a machine designed to prevent inadvertent or hazardous operation. And that's a lot what we're going to talk about today, prevention. Uh, the goal here is to recognize hazards and either cover them so that there cannot be a hazard or have the knowledge necessary to be able to recognize that and stay away. Because at the end of the day, the bottom line is that it's the responsibility of the employer, uh, or the company, to make sure that there's a safe working environment, that there are safe working conditions for all test operators. Uh, anybody who's used their equipment in the past, the reality of the situation is that you're dealing with high voltage equipment. These things can put out quite a bit of energy and they can give you a nice hit. I can test, uh, test to that personally. I've been, I've been whacked by these machines before when I wasn't paying attention, doing something stupid. Um, fortunately, on a lot of these machines, the current is very low. But fortunately for me, I also apply a lot of different safety materials and, and PPE and accessories on my testing station in the labs to where, while it didn't feel very pleasant, it wasn't a danger to me um, because I know what I'm doing and I'm trained on the equipment. Um, and, but even though that even turns to the point that even though I do know what I'm doing, these types of things can still happen. So it's always a good idea to employ extra methods to have a safe workstation. So look at, um, let's look at some potential shock hazards here. So there, there are various uh, what I would call ways or, or, or ways that current can go through your body to cause a potential shock hazard. And I'm, I'm generalizing here. But the main ones here is that contact is made from one point of a circuit to ground. Um, which is uh, showing Abe Lincoln there on the left-hand side, um, showing Abe Lincoln touching some kind of energized circuit. And since he is at a ground potential, it's gone through his arm, down through his body, out his foot, because his feet are grounded. It also could be contact is made with a hot metallic part while a person is at ground potential. So it might not necessarily be an exposed circuit. Uh, think about a panel box. Let's just say in a panel box, insulation on a hot wire has been frayed and now that's touching the metal of the panel box. And now you've gone ahead and you've touched that panel box. And let's just say for some reason or another the grounding circuit in that panel box is not proper and you're the grounding path. Current is a very lazy animal and it's going to take the path of least resistance. Whether that path is a grounding circuit, which hopefully it is, or that's you, that's the direction it's going to go. But there can also be a shock hazard by making contacts with two points of the circuit. You don't necessarily need to be at a ground potential for there to be a shock hazard. Uh, again, it just goes back to what is the most attractive path for the current. If the most attractive path is from one arm to the other, guess what? That's the path it's going to take. And unfortunately for us, if you do have a shock hazard where it goes through one arm and out the other, it also goes right across your chest cavity, uh, right across your heart, and that's when you can really run into some serious problems. And the takeaway that I want you to get from here is I think a lot of people have realized, especially people who worked with electrical equipment in the past, that um, you don't necessarily need to be at a ground potential for there to be a shock hazard. Even if you've isolated yourself from a ground potential, you still have to be wary because if you are providing a low current path for the current to travel, it's going to take it. So if you're the low resistance path, it's going through you, basically, is what this comes down to. Now, when we're talking about electric shock, um, there really isn't an all-in-one formula that says, oh, this is what's going to happen if you touch such and such current. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. It relies on quite a few variables to really um, drive this point. So it's influenced by several factors, and I've listed five here, and you can really break each one of these factors down into probably a hundred of their own variables. But if we consider these, it puts us in the, think of the right mindset to really look at a situation and determine if there's a risk involved. So your physical condition and response, for example, obviously if you have something in you like a defib or, or, or some kind of heart device, something that's, that's keeping like a pacemaker in your heart, um, you probably don't want to be using this equipment. Um, if you've read our product manuals, which 
Uh, most people I know don't read the manuals, but in every single one of our product manuals, at the very beginning of the manual, one of the first things it says is, do not use this equipment if you have a known heart condition, a pacemaker, anything along those lines, because that can affect it. The path of electrical current through the body. This is something I somewhat alluded to earlier in the last slide, where you could have a path that goes through your arm, down, out your foot, would be bad, but not as bad as, let's say you went hand-to-hand -hand contact across your chest cavity, which is pretty much worst case scenario going across the heart muscle there. So the path makes a big difference as to how much uh, harm that it does to you as well. The duration, or the length of time to which are you exposed. If you, like what happened to me, get a nice little jolt and you pull your arm away right away, that's obviously not going to be as bad as if you are exposed to enough voltage and current to where you have the inability to let go, um, in which case you really entered a dangerous situation because your muscles have contracted and now you cannot let go of the energized circuit. And the longer you're exposed, obviously the more damage it's going to do. The magnitude of the voltage and the current flow, and we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail on the next slide, um, talking about current and its effects on the human body. And then the frequency of the supply voltage. Uh, frequency makes a big difference. Um, there's this weird little range of frequency um, off the top of my head. I believe it's right around the 40 to about the 120 hertz range where it really reacts badly with your heart muscle. The way that your heart beats and the way electrical impulses go to your heart from your brain, um, that frequency range seems to really interrupt that. And that's when you get hit by something like line voltage, for example, in the United States is 60 hertz. That's a very disruptive pattern to your body. You can get hit by that and go into defib. And obviously, that's, that's going to cause you some problems. So uh, these are things to consider when you're, when you're looking at risk analysis and an electrical shock hazard in, in, on a station or in a setup. If we're looking at um, effects of electrical current, this is a general table that we have for some of this information. Again, this is fairly general. It really does rely on a lot more factors than just this. But we feel it necessary to at least break this down for you to give you a feel for what we're talking about. So if you look at this table, it's basically broken down into how much current and what is the expected reaction level. Now, something to keep in mind here, you'll see it at the bottom of this table. These effects are for voltages less than 600 volts. So line voltage, for example, 120 volts in the US, 240, 230, uh, other places in the world, especially Europe. So that's less than 600 volts. That's what we'd be talking about here for these current levels. Many electrical safety testers, uh, our equipment included, can output voltages in excess of 5,000 volts. These can cause much more severe reactions at much lower current levels. Uh, to my knowledge, this really hasn't been studied in depth, but I always considered it from the standpoint of, okay, if we're talking about these reactions are for less than 600 volts, and I'm dealing with thousands of volts, I'm going to be very, very careful, and I'm going to set up as safe of a workstation as I can to make sure this never happens because we have instruments as far as uh, most of the equipment that you'll find out there for high pop test equipment or, or dielectric withstand test equipment. It will give a voltage value and a current range, the maximum current that it can measure up to before essentially the unit trips out and is not able to measure anymore. You basically saturated the instrument and it'll usually give you some type of message over current or breakdown or something along those lines. We have equipment that can go up into the 100 milliamp range or higher. Now, if you look at this table, we're talking about extremely painful reaction, respiratory arrest, ventricular fibrillation. Death is possible in this range, basically meaning we have equipment, if it goes up to 5,000 volts at 100 milliamps, you're talking about a lot of energy. Now, fortunately, every single piece of our equipment has built-in safety devices that would um, shut off should you run into such a, a situation. but you want to take this from the standpoint of thinking, look, this equipment can do this energy level. I better make sure that I'm safe with it. So just keep that in mind. Being able to recognize what hazards you'd be exposed to is the first step of this whole process. Let's say, for example, you have one of our 3705 high pot testing instruments. It's an AC high pot testing instrument, and it can output a current of 20 milliamps. 20 milliamps, that's, that's a painful shock, possibly the inability to let go. Again, the instrument itself would most likely shut off, 
for you to run into a case like this because you do have some runaway current. But at the same time, consider it from the standpoint of this is going to be very unpleasant if I'm coming across this circuit, I come into contact with live energized voltage while I'm using this equipment. So something to be very aware of. Just look at the specs of the equipment you're using. It'll generally tell you the voltage level and the current level that it's capable of. And then plan around that when you're setting up your workstation. This is how it's a good way to train your operators, too, to let them know, hey, look, you're dealing with what's potentially a dangerous piece of equipment. So those numbers that I just gave on the previous page, um, I always thought it was interesting where those numbers came from. Um, a little funny. Uh, there was actually an experiment done by uh, UL. Um, and this experiment, it studied people's reactions to current under various current levels. Now, obviously, they didn't turn it up to 10 amps and see what would happen to somebody. Um, I believe that would be called murder. But what they did was they had, basically, they had people put their hand on a metallic cup uh, full of rice, and the other hand was in, um, it's either a copper plate or a saline solution. And they would run current through people's bodies and see how much rice they would drop from the reaction of the current. That's how I heard the story or read the report. I thought it was really interesting. And basically, based off of this, they saw how severe the reactions of current were on the human body. So I believe for this study, they only went up to about 3.5 or 5 milliamps. So they really didn't take it up much past that. But it did give a good idea that you can have some pretty severe reactions at very low current levels. And that kind of falls into um, when we talk as well about human body resistance. What is human body resistance? It's quite variable. Um, this model here, I think, is a good model to follow from the standpoint of being very conservative. Um, what I mean by conservative is these are pretty low numbers of resistance. And if you just look at Ohm's law, V equals IR, low resistance for us as test operators is a bad thing. We don't want low body resistance. Remember I said before, current is going to take the path of lowest resistance. So if you are that low resistance, guess what? It's going to party right through your body and not take the ground path that it's supposed to take. Or if the ground path is defeated, for example, you don't have proper grounding and you touch something, it's probably going to go through you. So I like to use this model because it is conservative erring on the side of caution. Um, the human body on average, if we look at this, has about 1,000 to 1,500 ohms resistance, depending on the path that it goes through, as you can see from this simple diagram. It's the outer layer. It's your skin that provides the largest percentage of the body's electrical resistance. Skin is an insulator, but just like any insulator, skin has a breakdown voltage. And if I remember correctly, it's right about 600 volts, going back to that table that we looked at with the effects of electrical current on the human body. Those were for reactions under about 600 volts, and I think that's the reason they used that number, because once your skin becomes punctured, it's the same thing as an insulator being damaged or an insulation breaking down it ceases to become an insulator. You now are dealing with a situation where your skin has ceased to become an insulator and it is now a conductor. That's what happens when an insulator breaks down. It carbonizes, it breaks down, and now it allows the flow of electrical current. That is not an insulator anymore. Now it's acting more like a conductor. Maybe a conductor with a slightly higher resistance, but a conductor nonetheless. Now unfortunately for us, our body internally is very good at conducting electricity. It has to be. That's how our brain communicates with the rest of our body. It sends electrical impulses via nerves. So nerves, blood vessels, uh, all those nice little organs inside of our body are actually fairly good conductors of electricity. So once this barrier, this skin contact is broken, you really don't have much more of a line of defense aside from safeguards built into a system like a proper grounding system, solid insulation, um, operator knowledge, things of this nature that are going to guard you against something like hazardous voltage. So keep this human body impedance model in mind as you're setting up your workstation, as you're training your operators, and as maybe you're going through this presentation with them in the future, um, that this is a good model to follow. This model actually assumes a pretty large contact area when we're saying 1,000 to 1,500 ohms. It would be the equivalent of me grabbing conductors with both hands, each conductor being about the size of a Coke can. So again, I'm assuming like when we're talking 1,000 to 1,500 ohms, whole hand contact on something that's fully conductive and energized when we're talking about a model like this. 
the reality of the situation is you're probably only going to come in contact with a circuit with like a finger or a part of a hand or brush up against something, something along those lines. Obviously, the larger the surface area, the lower the resistance. But if I do a fingertip to fingertip contact point, that's really more along the lines of about 20,000 ohms or more of resistance. Um, you know, if you're working in a building that has a simple ohmmeter, um, something that can measure simple continuity or a resistance value, you can run a really easy experiment. Take the two leads, put the little red lead in one hand and the little black lead in the other on your meter, and set it to measure resistance. See how much it shows there. I actually just did this yesterday, and I held one in each hand just like this between my thumb and my forefinger, and it was actually about 600,000 ohms of resistance with me just holding on to it. Then I got my hands wet, and I did the measurement again, and it dropped down to about 15,000. So the simple thing of having like a simple change, like having sweaty hands, or getting your hand wet, or getting your hand in oil, or something like that, will ch it, it changed for me by a factor of 10, a little bit more um, than a factor of 10 in the, in the resistance value by simply adding that moisture. So again, all things to keep in mind when you're thinking about these test setups. And here's some just simple models we've made up. Um, these are various um, experiments that we ran on Abraham Lincoln just to see what kind of currents would go through his body. So let's just say a really bad case scenario. You have whole co hand contact on two parts of an electrical circuit. That's that upper left hand picture there you see. And it's going right across the chest cavity through the hands. You'd be dealing with about 0 0.240 amps of current. Um, that's 240 milliamps of current. Now if we take a quick look back, 240 milliamps on this chart is basically death. Um, could you survive it? Sure, depending on what kind of, of, of physical response you're dealing with, but this is a really bad scenario in essence. If we jump down to the uh, middle picture there, let's just say we do have a little bit more resistance um, because it's going through our body, so it's got a longer path, it's got more stuff to go through. You're still talking 218 milliamps of current. The difference between 218 milliamps and 240 milliamps of current, uh, as far as your body is concerned, is not hugely different. Um, it's still going to cause some pretty big problems. Um, and then if we look at the top right there, what I was representing was instead a different surface area. Now we're talking fingertip to fingertip contact. And we're talking now, you see the value of 20,000 ohms. That makes a big difference. Now we're talking about 12 milliamps. And if we jump back, once again, to our table, 12 milliamps, well, now, would we get a nasty little shock? Yeah, we get a nasty little shock. However, the chances that that shock is going to be fatal are really, really low. So we've mitigated our risk quite a bit by simply decreasing the surface area to which it could be contacted. I realize that you don't always have that control, but that's why things like high-voltage gloves, PPE, insulation mats, things along these lines can be critical to keeping a safe workstation. So that kind of segues nicely into talking about testing and workstations, which is going to be the second half of this presentation. So testing. Um, and, and just to keep in mind, when we're talking about the types of tests, our high pot test, our ground bond test, leakage testing, those will be discussed, the tests themselves will be discussed in the next webinar. Here we're really outlining more the safety aspect of things, which I think is important. I think it's more important to understand safety first, then we'll talk about the tests, because then when you're going through this second webinar, the, the 102, which talks about the tests, you can think back to this webinar and kind of say, okay, well, now I see what this test is doing, and I understand the safeguards I need to build in a little bit better. So in any event, just keep that in mind when you're going through the next webinar, the information we learned in this one. So there are four main reasons why you should safety test your product prior to shipment. And obviously, if you're attending this webinar, you're already doing it or you're planning on doing it, or you've been doing it for years, and, and this is something that you're just kind of training your new operators on. Safety. You want to ensure that the product going out isn't going to pose a hazard to the user. I'm sure you've seen products with this nice little UL mark or CE mark or, or whatever the case is. Actually, I have a, um, here's the power adapter for the computer that I'm using right now. You can see it has several marks on it. We have a UL mark, and we have the CE mark for Europe right here, which means this adapter, this power adapter, has been tested with a high pot test and possibly some continuity tests. That tells us that it's safe. Um, in the United States, it's not law that you would need to test such products. However, uh, good luck selling them. 
in the open market if you don't have any safety tests run on products. Um, I've heard um, some nightmare stories with products that haven't been tested properly, especially for grounding, um, where, where deaths have been involved. And you can look those up on consumer web pages as well. Product recalls, things of that nature. It happens more often than you would think. You'd think this kind of testing and things like this are, are, are common sense, but there are a lot of uh, manufacturers out there that still aren't doing proper testing. So hopefully this type of stuff educates. Quality. You can detect workmanship defects and prevent faulty components from, even though it might not be fatal, even though you might still get the mark you require, you can catch defects that are just going to have a better product out there on the market um, when you run these types of tests. Cost control. Identify production problems before a product is shipped. This is going to prevent costly recalls. And I've seen a customer of ours get, and get our equipment and then test and find defaults that were somewhere in the production line this was happening and they were able to catch them as a result and not ship out the product um, which was a huge relief for them and you better believe in the end they were really happy they bought some testing equipment that they were able to use to catch these types of products and then of course liability one of the biggest reasons prevent product liability suits it's the responsibility of the manufacturer to run the proper testing to do this it's up to the manufacturer to make sure if they don't know how they're supposed to run these tests to call a consultant, talk to somebody like us who gets involved with these types of tests, talk to people like UL or Intertech or a testing lab who knows what they're doing and point you in the right direction. So, you know, the old saying, knowledge is power, goes miles and miles when we're talking about testing like this. It also comes down to risk analysis. Um, I'm sure there's probably at least, if I had to take a guess, 25% of you that have performed risk analysis with your production line testing, with your manufacturing processes, to find out where there might be problems. Um, you've also probably all dealt with a safety standard. And if you haven't, just real quick, a safety standard is basically the standard that tells you, for your type of product, what tests do you need to run. For example, if I'm testing a vacuum cleaner that somebody's going to use at home, I'm going to test to IEC or UL 60335 for household appliances, which calls for a leakage test and a high pot test and a ground continuity test. Um, and there's a big difference between type testing, which is in a lab, basically on a prototype, something that you're still working on, and production testing, which basically means every single product going out the door gets tested to make sure it's safe. Well, safety standards in recent years, um, in recent years, this is the shift that I've seen. Um, the safety standards mostly call up for type testing, but they do also say that you need certain production line tests. Most of the standards say your production line testing is your high pot and a simple ground continuity test. And that's it. More and more, though, I've seen manufacturers going through a risk analysis, and they determine they actually want to run more stringent tests on the production line. For one, one reason or another, maybe it's something in the manufacturing process. Maybe it's something they're concerned about. So they're going to cover their bases and run those tests. There's been definitely an uptrend in more stringent tests on the production line, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's better to cover your bases than, than be sorry later down the line. But for the most part, the production line tests outlined in the safety standards, they usually cover your bases. It's really up to you to do a risk analysis and determine what tests you need. Uh, that being said, we do have um, a couple poll questions during this webinar for you guys, and our first one is, is coming up um, shortly here in the next couple slides. And basically, we want to know from you guys, uh, in your production line testing, not your type testing, but what you're doing on the production floor, every single product that goes out the door, what tests are you running on it? And when I say what tests, I mean electrical safety tests. So we're going to give you guys some choices of high pot, continuity, ground bond, leakage tests, and insulation resistance tests. We'll give you five choices. If you're doing one, great. If you're doing all of them, feel free to select all of them. If you guys are doing all of them on the production line, that's great. You're, you're really getting your bases covered. Um, and one thing I want to point out is when I say continuity and ground bond, the difference that I mean between those is when I say continuity, I mean low DC current, basically the same thing as using an ohmmeter. A is the path there, how much resistance, and that's it. When I say ground bond, I mean high AC current to actually test the integrity of the ground circuit. So I might pump 25 amps through a ground conductor to see if it can handle that current. So that's the difference that I'm saying when I say bond versus continuity. So I'll let you go ahead and, and, and take and take about a minute to look at those questions, and then we'll discuss the results.
Okay, Nick, um, we went a little bit longer, but it seemed like everyone was uh, continuing to vote. We had about 84% of the people reply uh, that they're performing high pot. Uh, ground continuity was about 45%. Ground bond was 42%. Uh, insulation resistance was 47%, and leakage current was uh, 53%. Wow, that's, um, that's really interesting numbers. Um, again, we did this same poll question last year. Those numbers were not that high. Now, again, I, I know that doesn't speak to a specific trend in manufacturing. We're, we're dealing with a fairly small test audience here. But over the years we've asked these poll questions, those numbers from just our webinars have continually gone up. Um, the leakage current one especially surprises me. I'd say that's the biggest one where I've seen more and more people doing that in production as opposed to just the high pot test. And it's a really good test to run because what you're doing is you're powering up your product and you're measuring leakage current while it's powered up. It's kind of similar to a functional test except you're also measuring leakage current to see how much of a hazard it can pose. So excellent. Um, I'm really happy to, to see that those numbers were that high in running all these different tests. So thanks for sharing, everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, so kind of diving into what I was just talking about when I showed the little mark on my power adapter there, uh, let's talk briefly about testing laboratories. Now, we, we already talked a bit about the standard that I mentioned, 60335, right, for household appliances. Well, that's what these testing laboratories and bodies do. They create standards that outline performance and production testing. And they implement and enforce electrical safety testing for tech users from potential electric shocks. Now, so if anybody who's ever done manufacturing, if you've had to adhere to some of these standards, it can be a pain in the butt. Yes, we understand that. Um, I get involved with technical committees for standards myself. And I think it's very important, especially since I've gotten involved. These guys, um, the people that write these standards, really do take a lot of time, research, and effort to make sure that they're calling out for the right tests so that people can be safe. And it's not just calling out for the right tests. There's also quite a bit of consideration that goes into understanding that these are manufacturing environments, that these, these types of tests shouldn't be a burden to the manufacturer. To try to make it as universal as possible, not be a burden, but at the same time make sure that they're the proper test to uh, ensure that they're safe for the end user. So I think um, a lot of these associations go to great lengths to ensure that this is the case. And I've, had, uh, I've been very fortunate to work with quite, a bit of these or with our, quite a few of these organizations. So something to keep in mind. Other nice thing too, you know, dealing with whether it's UL, TUV Rhineland, which is based out of Germany, but they have a pretty strong presence in the US as well. CSA for Canada, ETL, um, Intertech, very big testing company. They've, they've, they've really um, been on the rise over the last several years. Triple C for China. Um, there's, there's several others. I'm sure that I'm not mentioning all of them. IEC, um, the International Electrotechnical Committee, um, is another big one. Go directly to their websites. They have a ton of information, a wealth of resource for you to find out what you need to do for your product. If you contact somebody at one of these organizations, I've never had a problem with anybody getting back to me. Um, they get back to me in short order, and I've always had my questions answered fairly thoroughly. So they're a really good resource to reach out to as well. And you probably recognize a lot of these marks. A lot of you probably deal with these companies. Uh, we do. Um, I know that. So we have several of these marks on, on our particular products. Now, the NRTL standards dictate that electrical products, and I'm sorry, just to back up real quick, NRTL, um, that's a moniker that stands for Nationally Recognized Testing Laboratory. I understand that's more of a domestic United States term um, because we have our own nationally recognized testing laboratories that goes through OSHA. And, and several other steps to make sure that you can be listed as an NRTL. But again, overseas, you'd be dealing with something like Triple C or CSA, um, NEMCO, um, DEMCO, um, things along those lines in Europe. Um, so, but that's what, when I say NRTL, I'm referring just to a testing body or an organization like that, like UL. Um, but they dictate that electrical products incorporate two lines of defense to protect the user from electrical shock. You have insulation and you have safety grounds, okay? And there's also, understand the difference between class one and two products, and that kind of ties into the insulation part as well. But insulation, in general, separates power lines from low voltage circuits. It separates power lines from isolated power supplies, and it isolates input power from the chassis or case of an electrical device, which, thank God, we're touching the chassis, so we obviously want that to be isolated because we don't want an energized case. You saw what happened to Abe Lincoln in the previous slide. It wasn't a good story for him. It wasn't a good ending. 
Safety grounds allows dangerous fault currents to return to the system ground. That's what a safety ground is for. You want to make sure that if something does go wrong with the insulation, that that current has somewhere else to go. That's not you. That's your safety ground. It enables your circuit breakers to open. It safeguards against fire, um, so that if you go beyond a certain amount of current flowing through a ground circuit, that's when your breaker trips, so it doesn't start a fire in your home or your business or whatever the case might be. And it protects against damage to electrical equipment. Okay. Now, when we're talking about insulation and safety grounds and things of that nature, it's also important to keep in mind that electrical products are generally classified, pardon me, according to insulation type. You have class one products, and what we refer to here is class two. Don't confuse this with other one class one and class two monikers for other types of products. Here, we're just simply talking about the type of insulation. Class one products generally will terminate in a three-prong cord. You know, something you would see as simple as a, a everything you use at home. For example, maybe your vacuum cleaner has three prongs. Um, most computers don't, they're usually dealing with a two prong, but that third prong, you have your two blades, as you can see in that picture, and then that round prong at the bottom. Um, what would essentially be the mouth of the smiley face, as I like to say when you're looking at an outlet. That's your ground prong. Um, and that basically gives you safety through basic insulation and proper grounding. So you have your insulation and your grounding as your two means of protection. Now, if you ever dealt with a Class II product, which everybody who's listening to this has dealt with a Class II product, do you have a smartphone? Do you have an iPad? Do you have a laptop? Well, all of the adapters that plug into the wall, you'll notice most of the time, there are some exceptions, they have two prongs. Why? Because there's no ground pin. So what they do is they use a uh, layer of dual insulation. So you have double or reinforced insulation instead of grounding as your extra means of protection. So this is going to terminate in a two-prong cord, and you get that safety through that double layer of insulation. And that kind of ties into testing for the next one, because a lot of times when you run a high pot test, you're applying your high voltage to your current carrying conductors, i.e. your line in neutral, the two blades, and you're returning on your ground or your chassis. Well, if you don't have a ground or chassis, how do you test? Kind of sneak peek for, for, for next week. I'm not going to get into that now, because I want you guys to attend uh, next uh, month, not week, sorry, next month as well. So. Keep that in mind as we're talking about um, these next few slides. So electrical accidents in the workplace. The most common reasons that these accidents occur are, are one of three factors. Unsafe equipment or installation, an unsafe work environment, and unsafe work practices. These accidents can be prevented through the use of insulation, guarding, grounding, and electrical protective devices for safe work practices. Also just training of operators and safe methodologies. Um, I've been to a lot of companies who have really good safety procedures and outlines that they make everybody go through with each routine, which I think is a great way to go. Don't take shortcuts. That's one of the biggest reasons I've seen people get hit is they've taken shortcuts in a work procedure because they were trying to hit a quota. Uh, trust me, hitting a quota is not worth you receiving a severe electric shock. So I'd like to show a few examples here of unsafe equipment or installation. Um, I love this picture. As you can see, that panel box right there is a mess. That is a rat's nest of pigtails and wires. You can't even tell. You can even see at the bottom of the box there's some exposed wires. You can't tell what's energized or not. I wouldn't even, as a trained operator, want to approach this box. This obviously is an exaggeration, but these kinds of installations exist all over the place. It just comes down to you know how much work went into them, how long they've been left, when's the last time something like this was inspected. So well, it is an exaggeration, it just goes to show that um, something as simple as some laying out wires can be a big problem, as you can see here. Um, an unsafe work environment, again, an exaggeration um, of this guy installing an air conditioner. That kind of looks like something my grandpa would have done. Um, but this is not definitely a work practice that you would not want to employ, uh, or a work environment that you'd want to be in to be what we would quote as safe. Um, and unsafe work practices. Uh, look at that um, power strip. Not only is there a lot of different things going into that power strip, you can clearly see where electrical tape is trying to be used as insulation for these particular wires. There is bare conductors exposed all over the place for this. Ex again, an exaggeration, but sometimes the exaggerated ones are the fun ones to look at, and they really kind of drive the point home, so to speak. Well, I think I just accidentally skipped this slide there. There we go. So. Let's talk about creating a safe workstation. How do we create a safe workstation? There's a lot of different ways you can do this. 
Um, there's a lot of options that you have for creating a safe workstation, um, which is necessary because not every work environment is the same. Not every manufacturing line is the same. Some of these, these uh, various methods for a safe workstation or creating a safe workstation would even be applicable or feasible on certain production lines, and we understand that. We try to get a lot of options, and we're talking about it during this webinar, to make sure that there is something you can do to make sure that you have a safe workstation. You can use an enclosure. The enclosure is designed to completely remove a shock hazard because it completely cuts off hazardous voltage. You can't reach within an enclosure while you're testing. You might have some interlocking device in there. So if that door opens, that test immediately stops. So an enclosure, in my opinion, is one of the absolute best ways you can get around any type of shock hazard because the user can't even touch it while it's, the circuit's energized. So that's my personal favorite method. I use enclosures in my lab all the time. I have several of them in here that I employ on a regular basis when I'm doing testing. Cabling and insulation, uh, something like a safety probe. If you've ever seen little probes, they look like little gun probes you can use to, to contact a conductive point and run a test that way because the probe has enough separation to where your hands can't come into contact with it and you can't get arcing voltage over to your hands. That's another way you could keep somebody from touching a hazardous circuit. Use of PPE personal protective equipment. That could be anything from safety glasses, high voltage gloves, if they could be used by your operators, high voltage boots, an insulation mat, things of, the, of this nature that you can use to make sure that things are safe. And then just being aware of all your nearby hazards. That comes down into play with trained operators, being able to recognize an electrical safety testing hazard, being able to recognize an electrical hazard. For example, as you can see there, that symbol that I'm showing in that picture right there on the very bottom, that's the high voltage symbol. That symbol is pasted onto every single, the front panel of every single one of our pieces of equipment. Everyone has the high voltage symbol and the caution symbol. So as soon as you look at the front panel of our instrument, power on or off, you're going to see those two symbols and know, oh, wait a minute, I remember that means caution and that means high voltage. I'm dealing with a high voltage piece of equipment. I better look at the instruction manual before I use this thing or talk to somebody who has used it so I make sure that I don't either hurt myself or somebody else when I'm using this in this workstation. So let's talk about different kinds of workstations here. Uh, I usually look at it as two main types of workstations. There's more. There's definitely more if you look at various standards, but I'm just going to break it down into two for the purpose of this webinar. You have your stations with positive protection. When I say positive protection, I mean that the hazardous portion of the circuit is completely cut off while the testing is happening. As you can see in this station, we've done that here with a DUT enclosure. You can see the enclosure labeled A. So the enclosure is labeled A, and what the device under test or the DUT, the device being tested, is labeled H. The high pop tester itself is B. The test operator is labeled C. So you can see he's working with the equipment that's right over to his left-hand side. It's completely enclosed off with an interlocking system. All of our instruments have an interlock, meaning if that enclosure door is opened, the test stops right away. You've broken the interlock on our device and the testing stops. Some extra methods you can see here, one labeled D, that's an insulation mat that the operator's standing on that isolates him from a ground potential. You'll notice that I have a G in there, that's a high voltage sign. That's letting anybody outside of the station know, hey, don't come in here unless you're trained because we have some high voltage testing going on. F, you can see an e-stop going into the whole station, so should somebody outside see a problem, they can hit that e-stop, not have to go into the hazardous area, and shut everything down. E, you can see a signal warning light. That's what we call a signal tower light or a signal light um, that you can wire up to these stations. So, for example, when a test is running, a red light goes on. When the instrument is idle or off, a green light goes on to show that, hey, to show everybody in the immediate area, hey, testing isn't going on right now. You'll also know that I have what's labeled I. What that's showing is a 10-foot spacing from the workstation. Um, that's actually a requirement, basically meaning if you are not a qualified operator, if you are not trained to work with this equipment and you're at a station that's in or near the high pot testing station, you must have 10 feet of separation. If you're not trained to work with it, it's 10 feet. Uh, bottom line, and OSHA will ding you for that. If you have working stations that are and are near a high pot testing station, if you don't have that separation, or at the very least other types of PPE, if you are within that 10 feet, you're required to have PPE to protect your operator. So that's something you really should keep in mind. So if OSHA came in and looked at a station 
and saw that there wasn't a 10-foot separation and there was no PPE and the people at the other station weren't even aware that there was high pop testing within that 10 feet, you could get dinged for that and I've seen it happen. But we also realized, you know, like I said, the best way to make sure that you have true protection is something like an enclosure. Now, I'm going to take a step back because I don't want people to get confused. It's 10 feet from exposed conductors. So, in this particular image, you will see that you do not have exposed conductors. It's in an enclosure, which means you technically wouldn't have to have that 10 foot of separation because there isn't a hazardous exposed conductor. I just wanted to outline that this 10 feet rule is something that exists with the NOSHA guidelines. But keep in mind, when I say that, I mean exposed conductors. So, so don't worry too much. If you're using an enclosure, you're in pretty good shape. But we also understand that not every DUT can fit in an enclosure. What if you're, you're testing an entire dryer or a washer? You would have to have a pretty big enclosure to put that in. So we also have what are called stations with no means of positive protection, meaning that there could be exposed conductors and things of that nature. And that's a station that looks like this. Again, you see a lot of those same safeguards in place. The signal lights, the high voltage warning signs, prohibited testing area, as you can see in that sign at the front labeled G. Here, you can see there's a gate up. Since there is exposed conductors, the, this station is making absolutely sure nobody's going to walk into here because it's completely fenced off. This is a really good method, and I think this is something that I've seen a few people employ, and it's a good idea because it's pretty clear if you were to walk by this station, hey, I'm not trained with that equipment, I'm not going to go in there. That's really what it comes down to. So uh, keep those two types of stations in mind. Ask yourself, well, what do I have? And am I missing something? In our manufacturing process, do we have the potential for a shock hazard because we're missing one of these things? Here's a good uh, example. A, a customer was kind enough to let us take a look at a picture of their station. This is a great station setup. You can see they have all the equipment up top. They have some software work in there, but they also have a DUT enclosure that's completely surrounding what's being tested so that there can be no way that somebody can touch this while it's testing. So this is just a really good example of the solid setup. You can also see this danger high voltage tape on the bottom there that's actually all around the floor too. It's a little hard to see but you can see it on the floor so that somebody doesn't walk into this station while it's testing. Even though they have an enclosure they still have those boundaries set. So Finally, to finish up here today, because I know we're, we're pre coming pretty close to time here, is um, I wanted to outline some additional methods of operator safety that you guys can use on your line. So if you're thinking maybe you're lacking somewhere in safety, there's a few things you can use here um, to make sure that safety is your first priority. Uh, dual remote palm switches, where you're really using use two hands to hit two switches. I've seen these used a lot in operations that require a lot of moving pieces of equipment. I was at aluminum casting foundry, where they have this big stamping thing that comes down. So the operator actually had two palm switches just like that so that while he was testing he couldn't put his hand in and, and get it pinched or something like that. That same concept can be used for high voltage testing because if you can't touch what's being tested you can't get shocked. Okay? So it requires simultaneous activation and both switches have to be hit within 0.5 seconds and if either if a hand comes up after either one of those switches during the test it immediately stops because it breaks the interlock. Um, so uh, that's something that um, actually we're going to be having a product offering for dual remote palm switches in the near future. We don't have them yet, but it's something we are going to offer soon. And you can find these on like Alan Bradley's website and stuff like that are components to make these switches. Um, and there's some rules with that that I'll get to in a minute. Signal tower lights. Mounted lights that warn operators of the nearby test area as to the status of the testing. Are you outputting high voltage or is it safe? Um, for example, you could illuminate red when a test is active. It could illuminate green when the test passes. Um, or, or yellow well the test is in process. There's, I've seen it done many different ways. The way I usually do it, I have it red while the test is in process, green when the test passes, and then just no or no lights on when it's just idle. Um, but you, you can choose to do it what way you see fit. We actually do offer these on our product page. Um, if you go to our accessories page on our website, asresearch.com, um, we offer signal tower lights um, where you can wire them up for operation like this. Safety mats, insulation mats. If you have a test station where an operator needs to use high voltage equipment, put a mat under them. It's like wearing high voltage boots. It's just an extra means of protection that isolates you from a ground potential. That doesn't completely negate the hazard, as we showed before. You don't have to be at a ground potential for there to be a shock hazard, but it helps. Um, this is also a product that we offer. Um, we offer 
mats. We also offer high voltage uh, warning signs. So um, those are a couple things to consider. If you want to check those out, go on our website or ask one of our guys. They'll be happy to help you. But you can find these all over the lab. So that being said, um, we have another question for you guys. And what type of, of these things are you using on your station? Are you using an enclosure? Are you using these lights? Are you using palm switches or an insulation mat? Anything along those lines. That's what we want to find out from you. So we have a couple options for you here. You're using all of them. Great. Um, mark down all of them. But we just kind of want to get a feel from you guys what you're currently using and to kind of get you to think about what you could be using if you're not. So we'll, we'll take about a minute for that question. Okay, Nick, I uh, closed it a little bit early. The voting was getting kind of stagnant, but we have 32% uh, are using the DUT enclosure, 12% uh, are using uh, dual palm switches, 16% would be using signal tower lights, 44% uh, are using insulation mats, and 60% are using uh, warning signs. Excellent. So the warning sign seems to be a big one. Um, that's kind of what I expected for the distribution. I, I understand that the lights and the dual palm switches and like that are kind of in a case-by-case, -case, you know, it's not always feasible to use those at every station. So that makes sense to me. The mats, that's good to hear. Um, that's probably one of the easiest techniques. The mats and the signs are two of the easiest techniques to employ. There's always room to put a sign. In a lot of cases and companies, a sign is required um, and the mats themselves as well. And that's good to hear about the enclosures too. That's, that's, that's a higher number than I was expecting. So excellent. Thanks, thanks for sharing, everybody. So I got a quick video here showing you a workstation um, that I, I set up briefly in our lab as just to kind of give you an idea. So bear with me here for a second. Um, I'm going to show you a workstation with positive protection employed and a workstation without. So what we have here, as you can see, I have my signal light. It's on. I'm just leaving it red and on because it's the, also, the high potter's on. Here's a DUT enclosure. And that door is wired up to the rear panel of this piece of testing equipment. So that's kind of what I'm showing there. That's going right into the back, because in the remote I.O. of our instruments, we have an interlock. So that's wired up to the door. So what happens is if I start the test, and then I open the door, breaking that contact, it's going to abort and let you know, hey, your interlock is open. This testing is immediately stopped. So I can reset that, test again. And uh, as you can see, if I leave the door closed, the testing continues. No problems. Now I'm going to show you another station without positive protection, just because we have a large DUT, as you can see to the right-hand side there. So I have dual remote palm switches here. And I have a big DUT, so I couldn't use my enclosure. So what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to push one, and then the other. Nothing happened because I hit them outside of the 0.5 second window. I'm going to try to push test. It's not going to let me because I have to do it through the switches. So now my test starts. But if I lift one hand, you can see right away it aborts. So I need to reset that failure, push both within 0.5 seconds, and leave my hands on the dual remote palm switches for the duration of the entire test in order for that palm switch to be effective. That just gives you an idea of other things you could employ. Let's just say you have too big of a product to put in an enclosure or an enclosure is not feasible. That's something else that you can do. So I just wanted to show you guys a couple examples of that. So some training resources for you. Go to the OSHA website, OSHA 29 CFR Part 1910.332 Subpart S. That's a mouthful. This defines the training requirements for anyone exposed to voltages in excess of 50 volts. So if you're using our equipment, that's you. Um, and, and it talks about qualifications for people, the type of training they need to use the equipment. 
NFPA 70E, that's a lot of what OSHA is based on, by the way, the National Fire Protection Agency 70E document. OSHA bases a lot of their stuff on that, so it's a really good document to reference. And then um, I had mentioned to you guys that standard, the British standard or European norm standard 50191-2010. This is for erection and operation of electrical test equipment. Basically, the type of station you would use if you're using our stuff. And it defines recommended setups. Really good standard. I recommend you bite the bullet. Um, by the standard and, and read through it. Like I said, it's only about 20 pages and it's got some great info for training purposes especially. Also, feel free to go to our website. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of uh, white papers. We have technical articles and I'm just going to click on this real quick just to show you guys. We have a lot of free resources for people. So as you can see, we have our webinars. We do on-site training, so if you want to do some on-site training, you want us to come out to you, that's something we will do, just to talk to uh, myself or one of our sales guys about it. We have an operator's guide, and we also have plenty of white papers and technical articles on this subject. As you can see, we have a huge resource of this type of stuff that you guys can take a look at. So just something to keep in mind, all that stuff is free, uh, aside from the on-site training, of course. Um, we do charge for that. We can certainly give you a quotation if you want us to train your operators in-house. No problem. If they want to be qualified with our equipment, we can get that done for you in a day. Keep that in mind along with the other stuff we sent you. Um, so if you want more information, if you want to contact us, or if you want a, uh, a copy of the presentation, let Jim know. We also have our website. And um, something I don't see up here, and that's, that's my fault. I was supposed to put it on this slide. If you have a question for us that we aren't able to get to during the Q&A, email us at info, shorthand for information, info at asresearch.com, and we'll handle your question. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. We always have updates, fun stuff, product release stuff, new technologies. These webinars, for example, if you follow us on those pages, you can get a lot of that information. Also on YouTube, we have a whole series of quick start videos that show you how to use our equipment. So a lot of resources that you guys can get. Uh, for free. Uh, that being said, I really appreciate everybody's attendance today. I hope you found this information useful. and We hope to see you at the next webinar and I'm going to leave it open for a couple minutes for some questions. I just saw a question come in here. Um, basically, do you recommend that operators wear high voltage gloves when working with this equipment? I do, um, but at the same time, I realize that high voltage gloves, they're thick. They're really difficult to work with. You lose almost all dexterity for me being able to grab things and, and use tools and stuff like that when you use that. So if you can use them, yes, I do recommend it. Um, a couple things, make sure they're rated. The high voltage gloves are rated for the voltage of the equipment itself. Um, for example, if I have a, a piece of equipment that can go up to 5,000 volts, I would use gloves that can go up to 10,000. That's actually what I have in the lab here. I have a set that goes up to 10,000. I have a set that goes up to 40,000 because we have equipment that goes up to 20,000 as well. I usually try to double that number. Um, and if you cannot use gloves for any reason, um, an important number to remember um, is the safety approach boundary. Um, we mentioned that I mentioned the 10-foot rule previously, and that's for non-qualified operators who are within 10 feet of exposed conductors. Again, the key word there being exposed. So if you have a DUT enclosure and you can't access the DUT anyways, the gloves really aren't necessary. However, if you have exposed high-voltage pieces, like on the dishwasher we showed in that example, they couldn't enclose that. So when you're running a high pot test, that's an exposed conductor. That's an exposed shock hazard. Even if you're a qualified operator, you're not supposed to get within two feet and two inches of the energized circuit. If you do have to get within two feet, two inches of an energized circuit, then you are required by OSHA to wear PPE. So keep that in mind. Hey, Nick, I had a question come through the chat line that I think is uh, fairly relevant, so I'm going to go ahead and, and shoot it out to you, and hopefully you can answer to the best of your knowledge. Um, but one of our participants wanted to know if exposed conductors are modified to be finger safe. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, only the surface level of a finger. Is that the equivalent of utilizing an enclosure, enclosure thus eliminating the need for a 10-foot boundary? 
I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure what they mean by finger safe. Um, if you're talking about what you mean, Jim, um, again, I, that would have to be clarified. But the, I, from what I know, the bottom line is if there is exposed conductor, it doesn't matter how big or small it is. Well, it does matter how big it is. If somebody can't touch it, then that kind of eliminates the shock hazard. Um, so from that standpoint, yes, again, I'm not 100% sure what finger safe means. If you can't get a finger in there, you can't touch it, then it's not technically an exposed conductor uh, from, from my knowledge of that. But whoever that was, if they could follow up with us at the info at AS Research, I'd like to discuss further. Not 100% sure what they mean by the word finger safe, but if somebody, if that means they can't get a finger in there at all, then, then sure. The other thing you have to consider too is a tool. Could somebody get a tool in there? Could they slip a tool in and touch something with like a screwdriver? Um, that could maybe be seen as reasonably foreseeable misuse. Somebody wasn't paying attention and could get a tool in there, that's something else to consider. Okay, Good thanks, questions. Nick. Yeah, I, I think he was at, uh, discussing uh, unable to touch, so. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I think you'd, you'd be okay in that regard. I mean, obviously I haven't seen the setup. I don't know what it looks like. But the other thing to consider for that person too is tools. Maybe if your operator used small screwdrivers, for example, and they could get their screwdriver in there, um, that's something to just be wary of. It's not necessarily a rule, I don't think, but um, something to be wary of to, to maybe train them on to kind of say, hey, don't, don't do this, or, or you can't use that tool at that station, whatever the case might be. That's something I think that would go in hand in hand with risk analysis. All right, good. Well, um, we got some good questions there, and if anybody has any questions we maybe weren't able to get to during the session, maybe they were a little bit more in-depth, contact us, and, and we'll discuss. But again, thank you for attending. We really appreciate your time, and hopefully we will see you next month for um, Electrical Safety Testing 102.